Hello, welcome back to another of my new videos. In today's video, we'll be looking on something very special today, a huge light bulb. This light bulb is known as induction lamp, or known as high frequency induction lamp, which runs about 2.4 to 2.6 megahertz frequency. And here you can see a massive bulb envelope. And the bulb itself looks very interesting and it is a fluorescent lamp. Normally, for fluorescent lamps, it never looks like this. It usually like, looks like in the tube form, such as this, the tube form fluorescent lamps. As the tube itself, it's very easy as there's two electrodes and passing an electrical current through the tube inside can excite the gas mixtures and excite the mercury vapor itself to emit UVC lamp, UVC light and excite the phosphor. This works very similar. Inside also contains the pending gas mixture with mercury in as well. The mercury will be vaporized inside under the low pressure. Under discharge, it will also emit UVC and the UVC will strike the phosphor and emit visible light. But we'll have a look on this interesting shaped bulb. First, we'll be twisting open and see what's inside. You can see there's no, no electrode. Such lamp is also known as electrode-less lamp. If we twist and open the bulb. Ah. Let's see the inside. We can see there's no electrode, only a little glass tube inside. And here's the external side, the inner, inner glass tube itself is being coated with either phosphor or either titanium oxide to reflect any additional light. And if you look very closely here, you can see a black dot, which is something known as getter, used to absorb all those impurities, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide. And here we can see here's two vacuum ports. This vacuum port contains nothing which is used to actually evacuate the entire glass envelope. But under this side we can see is something very special. If we just bring it closer, you can see a tiny little black dot. Just focus. Yep, this tiny little black dot, if we take ourselves a torch, give it more light, you can see it's basically known as mercury amalgam. The mercury amalgam itself is basically metallic mercury got absorbed onto some metal, either silver or something that mercury can dissolve into it and forming a solid which is much easier to handle and the workers wouldn't get poisoned by the mercury vapor itself, but it will still emit mercury vapor. So the alloy concentration has to be chosen very carefully and this is also temperature specific. And now go to the main part, the heart of the electric, electrodeless induction lamp. This thing, known as a magnetic coupler. This coupler itself you can see is made of some wires or coils wrapped around this black cylindrical object. This cylindrical object itself is known as a ferrite core. So this is not regular ferrite, this is known as the high frequency ferrite used in many those type of high frequency power amplifiers. Usually will be nickel zinc ferrite, not manganese ferrite or something similar that does not contain manganese. Manganese ferrite has the advantage of high permeability, but it will not handle high frequency as well. But the zinc-based ferrite, if I can remember, or the nickel-zinc-based can actually hand support much higher frequency, such as the 63 mixtures from ferrite or ferrox cubes. And we can see there's also coming off with a cable. This is not regular cable, it's actually coaxial cables. So which it also contains different colored wires coming off, one white and one black. 
basically why do they differentiate the colors is because one is used in the center of the coaxial one is used for the outer shielding so the outer shielding actually does not emit much emi but the sensor will actually carry the most of the rf power so the working principle is that when you insert such coupler into the induction lamp when this inductor got activated it will actually generate a toroidal ringed shaped magnetic field such a, like a field coming off and it will also generate a toroidal shaped electric field so the magnetic field goes out coming in a loop shape like that and it can also switch polarities but the electric field has to go round so this is the main heart so when you have a round shaped electric field so when the electric field has the round shape it actually generates enough potential to actually excite the gas so basically there's very high voltage being generated as well during the initial ignition stage once it's being ignited it will form the plasma toroid the plasma toroid will be act as the secondary part the secondary coil of a transformer so actually this lamp itself is a transformer unlike this traditional fluorescence lamp it uses two filaments but this one uses no filament as the filament is removed and energy is directly coupled by magnetic field into the center of the lamp and we can screw it back and this is the main thing we will have to take another look before i even close it the stem of the ferrite is actually aluminium so basically this is a heat pipe it draws away the heat from the ferrite and out on the base the base itself are also mounted with a heat sink shielding they actually have a massive surface area to emit the heat so the wire itself will not get damaged but it has also been wrapped with tapton tape captain tape actually so it wouldn't get damaged as easily and the ferrite itself is also temperature sensitive if the temperature gets too high the ferrite can actually lose its permeability and it will actually be disappeared in the magnetic sense so if we screw it back be really careful do not break the stem if you break the stem you're screwed basically the bulb, bulb itself is screwed Now, the bulb itself cannot be run by directly any DC or regular mains voltage in the special converter which is the ballast here. The ballast is very interesting. It has a very interesting internal components and selection circuitries to drive this bulb. And we will be tearing it down and have a look at the inside of this ballast. Here is the internal circuitry of this induction lamp ballast we can see the mains voltage about 220 volts or 240 volts will enter via this terminal here and pass through the fuse if anything goes wrong on the later stage and it's passed through a common mode choke with some filtering capacitor and some voltage regulating device which prevents a certain peak in voltage and here is the two bus capacitors acts in the half bridge mode here the full bridge rectifier will be charging the capacitors up about a 320 volts probably maximum out of the term terminals when the half will be about 160 volts and goes through this main driver circuitry diagram here so here we can see is a the main ballast choke the choke itself will act in the resonance mode called lc series resonance mode with some of the resonance capacitors probably here and one of the bypass capacitors here and providing the feedback with a single turn of copper wire and the frequency will be mainly generated by using this tor 
or right. The probably similar working principles to a regular CFL bulb, but this time the frequency is much higher, it's about 2.6 MHz, so therefore the device uses special MOSFETs, we can see on the base. Yeah, if we go to the other side, you can see some mounted plastic casing MOSFETs, with some also some SMD capacitors inside as well. But mainly this thing acts as a big heat sink. And mainly the frequency will be regenerated by this toroid. Probably has a much lower permeability, so allows the resonant frequency to be much higher in order for this LC circuitry to work correctly. And here is a starting post circuitry used to first post start the entire circuit when plugged in. And out of this terminal here will be connected to the main magnetic coupler of the induction lamp, which is basically an inductor, or known as the primary side of an induction lamp. The secondary side will be the plasma toroidal ring itself. And now you had a look on the inside of this lamp. What we need to do is now connect the bulb correctly to the correct terminals. If we can see here, it's very misleading. If we just turn on a flashlight, oh, it's too bright, is it? Yeah. So it says about output, but it's 220 volts and 50 hertz. It's absolutely misleading. It should be input, and this side could be output, is it? Yeah, it's correct. And we can see it says white here and black here with a black dot, which the black, if I'm right, is basically the shielding. It emits the least EMI. So let's reconnect this bulb. And here we go. Everything is being con connected correctly to a power supply that output the exact voltage it needed, about 220 volts. And this is insulated as well. So no need for the earth connections, as well as it has a current limiting, so if it exceeds 1 amp, the power supply will be shut off. Since this bulb is an 85, volt, uh, 85 watt induction bulb, so it's 1 amp is more than sufficient to drive this lamp, and 3, 2, 1, we turn it on. Wow, this is very bright. Oh, the eyes is glaring. As we can see here, the bulb is illuminated very even, evenly. You can see the tiny amount of flicker is because my power supply to power this ballast is slightly poor. But if you connect it to the actual mains, it shows zero flicker at all, or very very minimal flickers. And because it's so bright, therefore the camera itself shows a bit of the glare. But if you use this light to put it in a room, it simply illuminates the entire room. Basically, this bulb is an 85 watt fluorescent bulb, but without any electrode. And what you should never do now is when powering up this bulb to remove the magnetic coupler. If you do remove the magnetic coupler, what would happen is that the ballast would gone with a bang. This is the one famous stuff that had destroyed a lot of induction lamp to begin with. Because the induction lamp ballast itself is run on something called LC series resonance. So therefore, if you remove the load, the voltage inside the components and ballast can go infinite heights around the com capacitors and it will draw a very, very large current and it will destroy the two switching MOSFETs inside, which we can just see earlier on. And to turn it off, it's very simple, just turn the power supply off, and now it's off. And that's it, hope you like this video, as I shall see you in another of my new videos.